As Benjamin Netanyahu prepares to visit the White House, is the pro-Israel lobby the main reason his country has so much support in Washington? That's our debate. I'm Mehdi Hassan. It's been described by its supporters as the most effective interest group across the entire planet. How influential is the pro-Israel lobby in the United States? Some say it's anti-Semitic to even ask the question. That's our debate featuring Alan Dershowitz. But first, as the Syrian humanitarian crisis spirals out of control, what obligations do the richest countries have to refugees? Australia has been criticized for sending refugees to offshore detention centers. One facility was even compared to a concentration camp. It was on former Prime Minister Julia Gillard's watch that these centers were reopened back in 2012. Earlier, I sat down with the former Australian leader who's now chair of a global education campaign that aims to get all children into school. Our headliner, Julia Gillard. Julia Gillard, thanks for joining me on Upfront. How do you ensure all kids around the world are in school when the global refugee population is at an all-time high, almost 60 million refugees, more than half of whom are kids, according to the UN? What do you do with them? Well, this is a new and growing challenge, not new in the sense of we haven't had refugee kids before, mm. but new in the dimensions yes. of it. Uh, fully 50% of what we do is in fragile and conflict-affected countries, so we do know how uh, to work a development model that gets kids into school. But we also need to add different ways of working when children are first displaced. I'm thinking of the Syrian children who have fled into Lebanon and Jordan mm. and Turkey and what more the world can do in those sorts of circumstances to make sure kids but are educated. But just the world. Don't you think rich countries, developed countries, the West, for want of a better phrase, should be doing more for refugees, more for refugee kids in terms of sharing the burden a great deal more than they do. The majority of those kids and those refugees are in poor countries. Well, frankly, I think uh, the world and the wealthiest parts of the world have got a great responsibility here. Uh, let's look at a government like the one in Lebanon that is trying to ensure Syrian children get an education. One in five members of the population is now a refugee. Absolutely, and so they've taken the very tough decision to double shift their schools so that there are more places and more children can go but they need donor nations to keep assisting them to make that viable and possible yes there's a responsibility but, there but given Lebanon and the numbers Lebanon takes in do you know what proportion of the world's uh, asylum seeking uh, population Australia takes in on an annual basis I don't know what proportion but I do know by the standards of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees we've been a very generous uh, resettler of refugees. We've always operated a very sizable your, program. Your country in 2014 received just 0.43% of the world's asylum claims. So not just to pick on Australia, but the point is countries like Australia surely could be doing more in terms of taking in people. Uh, yes, and uh, the current government has indicated that it will uh, up the quota, particularly for Syrian refugees, so that there are more places available. And my own political party, which is currently in opposition, certainly was uh, first out there advocating a great deal of generosity and increased places. I think we can uh, move the statistics around a few ways here. I am confident uh, that if you do all of the comparisons, you'll find per capita and Australia, Australia as a nation of 23 3 million people is a very generous and constant resettler of refugees. Up to a thousand people are believed to have died trying to come to Australia by boat over the past decade and yet many of your critics say that you as Prime Minister were no different to your Conservative predecessors or successors in trying to turn away those asylum seekers who were trying to reach Australia. Well, you've given the key reason why we want to do everything possible as a nation uh, to discourage people from taking that very dangerous journey by boat. Uh, you get out your map of the world and look at the stretch of water. None of us want them to get on boats, but once yes, they're correct. on the boats, what was Australia doing? I mean, the UNHCR was saying that your deterrence measures rendered the market for smugglers more profitable. You actually well, incentivise those smugglers? Uh, absolutely not. I do not. That's what the United Nations well, I High Commission of Refugees, uh, who you I were just quoting, yeah, I that's what they said about yeah, your Yeah, well, I don't agree with that analysis. Okay. Uh, Australia, I understand when the world looks at Australian policies, uh, sometimes there's uh, a kind of sense of puzzlement about why a nation that is such a multicultural, harmonious community that has settled so many migrants and so many refugees takes such a hard-line approach by people arriving by boat. 
uh, but the hardline approach, in my view, does have a humanitarian underpinning, which is we do not want people taking that journey and running those risks. I know what we it's appreciate, like. I appreciate that, and uh, I would agree with you. Well, no I, I don't think you quite but know what it's like. my point is, once like they're as, on the boats, you yes, can't... Yes, and you don't quite know what it's like as Prime Minister to get the telephone tell call me. from your defence forces that tell you that they suspect that an asylum seeker boat has gone down and they're uh, engaging in desperate measures to try and rescue people from the water. Well, it happened, didn't it, in but December whatever, 2010? whatever they do, people die. In December, uh, so December that 2010? That is the underpinning of That the happened policy. in December 2010, great tragedy off the shore of and Christmas Island uh, where 48 people including children were killed when a ship carrying 90 asylum seekers went down. Refugee campaign in Australia blamed your government. They said it was your anti-refugee policy that was responsible for the tragedy and quote, blame lies with the Australian government. Well, frankly, I think that's just... Uh, Those are refugee campaigners in sure, Australia. Sure, and I respect people who always campaign for, you know, more and more and more uh, for people who want to show greater compassion. But that has to, in policy measures, also be balanced with how you can uh, deal with the humanitarian... You don't think there's anything you could have done to save that ship or other ships that were in oh, I, I think an, an analysis of that to, to say uh, there is personal responsibility here. Or that, governmental that, responsibility. Well, all go government all governmental led. responsibility. The government I led uh, was trying to do everything it could to deter people from getting on boats. We were doing that in the context of putting up the number of places for refugees in Australia. So our message to people who were desperate and fleeing hard circumstances was we are going to take refugees but don't try and make the journey by okay. boat. You may not survive. Your children may not survive. That was the message. I appreciate that and you made that point. Your party scrapped Conservative Prime Minister John Howard's so-called Pacific solution to the refugee crisis, the policy of transporting asylum seekers to pretty horrific detention centres on island nations in the Pacific for so-called offshore processing. But once you became Prime Minister, you reversed that decision, you reopened those detention facilities on Manus Island and on Nauru, despite having once called them costly, unsustainable and wrong as a matter of principle. And when you see a transnational crime like people smuggling and what we're talking about uh, with the syndicates that operate out of Indonesia in particular, uh, this is a business in which people are making a lot of money. And Agreed. like other transnational crimes, whether it's uh, trying to move people for the purpose of sex slavery or whether it's trying to move guns or drugs, uh, the way in which the criminals pursue this changes over time. And so do, We agree the criminals so do, and the trafficking is wrong, but you said the centres and, were wrong, and the so offshore do, processing And so was wrong. do government strategies have to deal with the reality of contemporary but Something that's morally wrong doesn't ch start being morally right because of a change in political circumstances. It's not a change... You, you called it morally yeah, wrong. You called it matter, wrong uh, as a matter you, you of principle. Use, you use the words political circumstances, that's not what I'm talking about. But how does something that was wrong about, as a matter of principle become right as a matter of principle? I'm talking about the factual circumstances I faced where we were seeing increasing numbers and consequently increasing people taking the risk and responding to that contemporary reality. Uh, we had a policy that I wanted to pursue, which was a cooperative arrangement with Malaysia. I was blocked by the parliament from doing that. And I High Court said it was illegal as well. I, believe uh, the High I Court operated said it was illegal. in a, a minority government, and we could very well have legislated that as a solution. We weren't able to do that in the political circumstances of who had the numbers where in the House of Representatives and Amnesty the Senate. Amnesty said asylum seekers on Nauru were subjected to toxic and inhumane conditions with human rights completely sidelined. The UN Human Rights Committee found that Australia, on your watch, had breached the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights by detaining refugees arbitrarily and indefinitely. Well, That's they, pretty strong stuff. Uh, and uh, I would uh, dispute a number of those things. The Amnesty's but we're wrong, talking, the UN Human Rights we're Committee's talk, wrong. We're talking about past history. Uh, the current government has its own sets of policies. I'm not it's asking kept, about the current government, I'm asking about your government. Yeah, yes, and I'm happy to answer it, but really, so, so realistically, were they toxic conditions? realistically, we're talking about past history where I understand people will debate, they do within my own country, and they do globally, and let's look at what's happening in Europe now and some of the debates and, and, and about, Europe has what its own are, problems, indeed. about what are the best but the reason I'm asking is because set of policies. Agreed. But if I can finish my sentence, Please. Uh, what are the best set of policies? Uh, we took a set of decisions in a very difficult time Agreed. when we were seeing increasing numbers and we were worried about deaths. 
but your critics say that when you were Prime Minister, you had no qualms about locking up refugee kids, about putting them on detention in distant islands in pretty grotesque conditions. The number of refugee children detained well, peaked well, under your government. Uh, well, I think that once again is uh, you know taking a snapshot of history. Uh, which the number of children in detention peaked at 1,992 under the former Labour government in July 2013. That's Australia's Human Rights Commission. And uh, we had a variety of models of what detention was. And when you use that word, you were conjuring up an image of a big I'm facility. I'm just quoting Australia's yeah, Human and, Rights and Commission. And many, many of the facilities were quite different to that, suitable for families. Kids were in school. Kids were in school. They were and in terms of what I do now, uh, my prime mission is to make sure kids are in Even school. Even if they're detained at the and, same time? Um, in whatever circumstances children are, I want them to get a great quality education. So that is my mission now. Yes, as a national leader, I have to make decisions about migration policy. I stand by the decisions I made. I fully explained in my book some of the political roadblocks to what I thought were better solutions that were put in my path, and so then I had to take alternate decisions. People can weigh that record, but to suggest that that record in any way undermines my passion or my credibility on education is to wholly misunderstand it. Julia Gillard, thank you so much for joining me on Upfront. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. The veteran Israeli peace activist Uri Avenary once joked that if the pro-Israel lobby in the United States were to table a resolution abolishing the Ten Commandments, 80 senators and 300 congressmen would sign it at once. As Benjamin Netanyahu prepares for a visit to the White House, why does Israel continue to command so much support here in Washington, D.C., especially in Congress? Is it thanks to the efforts of the pro-Israel lobby? Or is that all just an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory? I'm joined in the arena to debate this by Alan Dershowitz, Emeritus Professor of Law at Harvard University and author of The Case for Israel, and Brian Baird, the former Democratic congressman who stood down from his seat in 2010 and has since complained that pro-Israel lobbyists see members of Congress as basically for sale. Gentlemen, thanks for joining me in the arena. Uh, Brian Baird, what was your experience of the pro-Israel lobby, specifically of APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, that turned you off them? Uh, did you feel you had to toe some sort of APAC line or pro-Israeli line or else? Well, you know, like many Americans, I, when I ran for Congress, I had and still have a great affection and admiration for much of uh, Israel. But as one is there, the, one, I studied the policies more and the practices in Israel and, and began to have some real concerns about it. Perhaps more uh, greater troubling was the influence of a biased perspective on Middle East issues and how it affects our American elections and our American policies. And, and that grew as I learned more and more, visited the region more and more. And yes, you know, there is a tendency to say, if you don't pass a certain lisp, litmus test, use certain words, take certain positions, you will be penalized. Uh, and you're it, speaking from personal experience. Oh, yeah, so sure. G give me an example of something that you, you were annoyed at being having to say well, or do or being asked to do. On a regular basis, resolutions come before the Congress, and people ask, ask, how is this going to be scored by APAC, or how are people going to take a position on this? And it's very clear that there is a right way and a wrong way, not necessarily for America's best interest, but that a certain lobby and certain interest groups want you to take a position or you will be penalized if you don't. What, in your view, is the penalty? Is it a financial penalty? Well, it's is predominantly it a, a financial penalty in some districts. I mean, there are other districts where it could be electoral votes, but in many cases, it's, it's financial. It's contributions to your re-election campaign. Alan Dershowitz. Well, I think that's a very narrow point of view. First of all, the strongest lobby relating to the Middle East in Washington is clearly the Saudi lobby. The Saudi lobby has its tentacles into the State Department, the Defense Department, the White House. They offer jobs to people who are in government. Every time there's been a conflict between the Saudi lobby and the uh, APAC lobby, the Saudi lobby wins, going back to uh, when uh, the Saudis wanted to buy AWAC planes and uh, APAC was against it. The Saudis win. The Saudis always win because they have far, far more money and far, far more influence. The reason that the APAC has some influence in Washington is because Americans overwhelmingly support Israel. That's why senators from Montana and South Dakota, who receive not a penny of contributions from APAC and who have no Jewish constituents, constantly vote for Israel. And I think it's uh, bigoted in some respects to focus on that one lobby. Uh, when you look at, for example, the, the American Association of Old People, AARP, much, much stronger lobby. The gun lobby, uh, 
the interesting comparison between the Saudi lobby, Saudi lobby is influential despite the fact that no Americans support Saudi Arabia. So it's purely the work of a lobby. Whereas the work of AIPAC is very simple because they're on the side of what Americans are on the side of. So get off this business about the AIPAC lobby and start talking about the merits of the case. Let's put it back to uh, Brian Bed. I mean, Congress is simply reflecting public opinion, not lobbying efforts. Well, let's be clear. First of all, there's plenty to criticize about Saudi Arabia, and we should do so. But our ability to do that is impaired by what is perceived around much of the world by a blind, almost obedience to certain Israeli positions. And by the way, there are plenty of people within Israel who criticize Israeli policies and plenty of people uh, within America who do. So it's not a bigoted thing by any means. It's a legitimate analysis of is this policy consistent with American values? Look, the, the issue is this. In America, we have lobbying. We operate through lobbies. What is bigoted is to focus on this one lobby. What's bigoted is to fail to understand that in virtually every other part of the world, there is bias and bigotry against Israel. The United States is the one country along with Canada that supports Israel, and it supports Israel not because of any lobby, it supports Israel because Israel has offered the Palestinians peace three times in the last uh, 20 years, Alex the Dershowitz. Palestinians have rejected it. They support, let me finish my point, please. They support Israel because Israel doesn't start this, quote, cycle of violence. It responds proportionally to the cycle of violence. It supports Israel because Israel doesn't start rocket firing by Gaza. It responds to it. Americans support Israel. That's the reality. And but lobbies can only be as good as their support is by the American people. But Alan Dershowitz, you talk reality. about... If you talk focus about, on this one lobby is bigoted, yes. Okay, you, you talk about focusing on this one lobby. Bill Clinton described AIPAC as stunningly effective, better than anyone else at lobbying in this town. Good. Newt Gingrich... Well, that's very hold on, hold on, hold on, that's hold on, hold on let me finish my point now. Newt Gingrich called AIPAC right. the most effective general interest group across the entire planet. Are they bigots for saying they're the best at what they do? You're saying they're not the best at what they do. No, no, no. I support that. I think that AIPAC is very effective, and thank God for that. That's a good thing. Would you want a pro-Israel lobby to be ineffective? It's very effective, but the reason it's so effective is it has support among the American people. This is not anti-Israel. And the, it, the two things, the, tr the strategy here is to say, if you criticize any of Israel's actions, you are A, anti-Israel, and you're B, bigoted. Neither is the case. I support of Israel not. in many I ways, but many it's now, Mr. Dershowitz, but some of their policies, Mr. Dershowitz says that Israel responds proportionally. I've been to Gaza. That was not a proportionate response. It was a vastly disproportionate response. To uh, Nobody condones the missiles coming from Gaza. But look, Israel has basically created the world's largest open-air prison. They restrict Gazans from all sorts of things. They invade... Okay, but the bringing the subject home. back to the debate, I know so both of you point, want to though. debate Israel-Palestine. It's been debated endlessly on this channel and others. But here's I'm, the point. In Ga when, when Gaza came along, your colleagues didn't support you on that. They voted something like 390 to 5 Why in favor is of that? Israel. Because the American Congress the right is... Well, Mr. Dershowitz may think so, but the fact is most of the members of Congress had never tried to get to Gaza, never talked to people who had been to Gaza, had not even read the report. What are they doing going down to the floor of the House of Representatives, voting on a report they've never read about a place they've never been? That's a problem. And why is that the case? Because no, the lobby is because people no, are so effective. No, it's not a problem. Look, I've been to Gaza, and it's very clear what the policy of Gaza is, and that is what I call the dead baby strategy. They purposely fire rockets from within highly populated okay, well, areas in order to induce Israel <laughs> Alan Dershowitz, to respond. We can have a great debate so about that, Gaza, and I can, and I, we can have a well, that's what we're having. No, we're, we're having, having a debate, debate about Gaza, because I have to say to you, Congress the human rights Israel groups disagree with what you say, but I don't want to have that debate so with you. let me get back to this. Let's well, issue. Do, do you some believe... Do you, so when let me put this to you then, Alan Dershowitz. In 2011, Benjamin Netanyahu, sure. who came to Congress, spoke in front of Congress, infamously got 29 standing ovations. Tom Friedman, New York Times columnist... Infamously got... Wait a minute. Infamously got ovations? Well, if... If you, you let me finish saying that, Alan. Let me. If you let me finish the well, question, you, you, how can you use the okay. word infamous? All right. So you don't like that being interrupted, but you word. want to interrupt me. Okay. Well, let me put. Let me quote to you a bigot. Tom Friedman, Jewish columnist, New York Times columnist, said, and I quote: "Those standing ovations were bought and paid for by the Israel lobby." Is Tom Friedman an anti-Semitic bigot in your view? Well, he was wrong about no, no, that. Is he a bigot? I was my question. There when is Tom I was a bigot, there is when question. Benjamin Netanyahu spoke. Alan Dershowitz, no, I'm giving you a chance. Finish. No, no, I'm asking you a question. Is Tom Friedman a bigot? Uh, Answer the question, please. No, he's wrong. No, he's simply wrong about that. You can be wrong without being a bigot. You're a bigot when you use words like infamous. I'm a bigot. Against, uh, when okay. you talk about people applauding. I was there. I saw the genuine 
support that Christians have for Israel, that people of every religion have for Israel. Americans understand that Israel is their partner for peace in the Middle East, and that's why Americans support Israel. That's why Israel is uh, effective in Congress. That's why AIPAC is effective. I agree with Bill Clinton. AIPAC's very effective Ellen, because I'm it has a relatively easy you. job Please do. supporting a group that is widely supported in America. Yes. Ellen, I'm doing my best to not interrupt you, but please do give me a chance to respond. When you want to run for Congress, you are keenly aware that if you, you have to spend much of your life raising money, often in small contributions, and yet one large donor can write a million dollar check, not based on your position on the United States issues, but based on interests of Israel. In the departure address, the farewell address of George Washington, he cautioned against blind loyalties or blind animosities to foreign countries. And he said, if you do this, factions will develop in your own country that are contrary to your own country's best interests as people curry favor with the foreign nation. And the other thing he said, which is really telling here, he said that people will, will these factions will attack patriotic Americans and say, you are not patriotic because you don't sign up with this faction. That's tantamount to saying they will engage in calling people bigots who disagree because they're allied with a foreign country. And that's just wrong in the American government. I don't think most Americans well, the want reason, their country to okay, ally with a any foreign country like that. The reason I think you are a bigot, sir, is because you focus only on the Israel lobby. Well, let me put that point to, to Brian. Is, do we, you would accept, would you not, that while some people talk legitimately about influence of the pro-Israel lobby in, in the context of the gun lobby, the pensioner lobby, the Israel lobby, there are some on the pro-Palestinian side who do see it in a anti-Semitic way, who do see it in a bigoted way, who do have this kind of sure. conspiratorial views of Jews running the world or running around. You would accept should, that? We should adamantly and vigorously confront that. Anti-Semitism is flat wrong. Race Racism is flat wrong. But there are plenty of reasons that we need to confront both. And what I'm saying, Alan, is that bias does not allow us to, in an even-handed, objective way, say, here's what we support about this country, including Israel, which there is much to support. But it does not allow us to say that policy is wrong. And there are policies that engage, the Israelis engage in that are wrong. And when one raises those, they are called anti-Semitic and they're called bigoted. That shouldn't that's be. Just, that's just false. That's just false. Take the settlements. The vast majority of uh, congressmen who support Israel are critical of the settlements. I'm critical of the settlements. The president's critical of the settlements. Many Israelis are critical of the settlements. Nobody complains. Nobody ever calls. But Congress any, hasn't look, done anything. As I said before, if criticism, if criticism, let me finish, please. If criticism of Israel were anti-Semitic, the largest concentration of anti-Semites would be in Tel Aviv, and the largest anti-Semitic newspaper would be Haaretz. Of course, criticism of Israel is legitimate. I engage in it all the time. I've been critical of the settlement policy since 19. The point is this. The point is that Israel generally is America's strongest ally in the Middle East. It, they depend on each other. They're mutually dependent. And it's very good. It's important for the United States to have another democracy in the area. Nobody knows where the Saudis will be in a year from now. Nobody knows who will be running Egypt. Nobody knows what Syria Alan, will look isn't like. The point, Everybody knows isn't the point, that Israel, you're not letting me finish. Everybody long, knows long, that Israel as a, as a short TV will program, support you, the United States. I think you've States, given very good And that's why the answers. Israel lobby is strong. And you made that. Let me pick up on something you said throughout this discussion about American public opinion being behind Israel, which is right. true. The polls show that 55% right. of Americans want their government to lean towards Israel. In Congress, though, something like 95 percent of congressmen lean towards Israel. One in four Americans wants the U.S. to oppose a Palestinian state. Congress voted 407 to 6 in opposition to a Palestinian state. So there's a huge disparity in terms of modest American support no, no, for Israel you're wrong and about, massive you're wrong unconditional about support. What, Congress didn't vote 407 no, to 6 in 2011 against a Palestinian no, state? No, what Congress voted for was not to have a Palestinian state based on not negotiated between the Israelis and the Palestinians. You're bringing just extremist statements. When you look at the way Congress actually votes, you see that they do reflect the will of the United States. Well, 410 to 8, 390 to 5, 407 to 6, looks, yeah, not, looks that, completely one-sided. That one reflects sided. the points of view of the I'm, United I'm States sure on a great many that, of Brian, these issues. It is, it when is. you talk about a Palestinian state, let's talk about it in a nuanced way. Alan, the reason there doing, is no Palestinian state is because the Palestinians rejected the offer in 2000, 2001, 2007. They refused to sit down and negotiate. Netanyahu has made an open-ended offer to negotiate now. What Alan Americans is doing now is position. exactly indicative of the problem. 
it's a filibuster. One side gets to speak, dominate the other side, accuse them of anti-Semitism, and defend policies that are not defensible. Here's the reality, Alan. You know as well as I do that if the United States government, which since every president in the last 20 years has said the settlements need to stop, if a president asks someone in the Congress to introduce a resolution saying that we are going to withhold, to actually put some teeth into that, we are going to restrict Israeli foreign aid if the settlements don't stop because they're contrary to international law, contrary to the national interests of this United States of America, the Congress of the United States right now would not support that. They would undermine it. We'll have to leave it there. Gentlemen, thank you so much for taking time out to be on the arena. That's our show. Up front, we'll be back next week.